Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Video Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. You may access a handout of this presentation to make notes while viewing this video hot topic. At the end of this presentation, you will be taken to a brief survey. We appreciate any comments or suggestions of future topics that you may have. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Stefan Grebe, Chair of the Division of Clinical Biochemistry and Immunology at Mayo Clinic. Accurate assessment of thyroid function relies on thyroid stimulating hormone, that is TSH, and free thyroxine, that is FT4. Dr. Grebe reviews the strengths and weaknesses of the currently available thyroid hormone assays. Thank you, Dr. Grebe. Thank you for the introduction, Sharon. First of all, the obligatory disclosures, of which I have none. Now, the topic of today is thyroid function testing. The thyroid gland can have both diseases of its structure as well as its function. What we are going to look on today is simply the function, so hence just on the right side of this equation. Just to remind ourselves briefly about thyroid function and its regulation, it's a typical and classical negative feedback endocrine regulation system. The pituitary gland secretes a thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH for short, which in turn interacts with the thyroid gland and makes it produce increased amounts of thyroxine, also known as T4 for short, and triiodothyronine, also known as T3 for short. Both of those provide negative feedback on the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, and as their levels increase, the levels of TSH are downregulated, a classical thermostat. Consequently, all of those three, TSH, T4, and T3, are the prime hormones for assessment of thyroid function. Let's cover them one by one. Thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, has many reliable assays. They are all of them today very reliable with a wide dynamic range. It provides an integrated measure of thyroid hormone action. Being the target of the feedback inhibition, it really gives the measure of the tissue effects of thyroid hormone. Furthermore, and we will enlarge on this further down in this uh, presentation a little, the response of TSH to changing thyroid hormone levels is greatly amplified, making it exquisitely sensitive to changes in thyroid hormone levels. Finally, another plus is that it is not affected by any binding protein changes. There are, of course, also a few minuses. First of all, it's obviously an indirect measure of thyroid function, as it measures the response to rising or falling thyroid hormone levels. So there is some delay in responses to acute changes in peripheral thyroid hormone levels, which in some clinical situations could be a disadvantage. Finally, in a very rare case, this is less than 1% of cases, where the patient might have pituitary or hypothalamic disease or thyroid hormone resistance or some other exotic disorder, the TSH measurement alone can be misleading. Total thyroxine has several advantages of its own. First of all, the assays, like those for TSH, are pretty reliable, and they're a good measure of thyroid gland output. Moreover, the changes occur fast when thyroid gland activity changes, which makes it very suitable for investigating acute changes in thyroid function. However, the concentrations of total thyroxine are highly variable and highly dependent on the variable thyroid hormone binding globulin concentrations. TBG, which is short for thyroid hormone binding globulin, is the main binding protein for thyroid hormones and its concentrations can vary widely depending on a number of exogenous factors such as sex hormone concentrations or liver function. Only a small fraction of the total thyroxine is free, and that's actually a biologically active fraction. This small fraction, in addition, is a pro-hormone, the active hormone being actually a T3. And finally, the assays themselves, while reliable, have the limitation of being all competitive assays and hence suffering from a limited dynamic range. Total T3 has also got reliable assays, and it represents the active thyroid hormone. Again, changes occur fast with changes in thyroid gland activity, and over the other analytes mentioned, it can have occasionally the advantage of being selectively overproduced in thyrotoxicosis, particularly early on. 
However, similar to total T4, the concentration is linked to the highly variable thyroid hormone binding globulin concentrations. And only a small free fraction of T3 again is biologically active. Furthermore, the circulating levels of T3 may not be representative of the levels found at the actual tissue sites as the majority of T3 is actually not secreted from the thyroid glands but manufactured in peripheral tissues on demand. And finally, all T3 assays are competitive assays similar to T4 assays and hence suffer from the same problems of a limited dynamic range. The free hormone measurements can obviously address some of the shortcomings of the total hormone measurements. They also, at least for free T4, are reasonably reliable, give a good measure of the thyroid gland hormone output, change fast with thyroid gland activity and, most importantly, are independent of TBG concentrations and they represent the biologically active fraction of T4. However, for the free T4 the same goes as for the total T4, it is a pro-hormone, the active hormone is T3 and levels can occasionally fluctuate with non-thyroidal illness when binding protein levels change very rapidly and it takes a while for a new equilibrium to be established. In those situations, free T4 measurements can be misleading. Standard assays again have a very limited dynamic range and at some ranges of binding protein concentrations they may be unreliable. Free T3 has the same advantages more or less as free T4 and very similar disadvantages. One of the major disadvantages here is that all current free T3 assays have serious shortcomings and generally are not recommended. They are too unreliable in many clinical situations. The limitations are caused by and large by the very low concentrations of the analyte which is being measured. Free thyroxine concentrations are already only a few percent of the total thyroxine concentrations. Free T3 concentrations in turn are only a few percent of the total T3 concentrations and the total T3 concentrations are never more than 20% of the total thyroxine concentration. So we're talking about low picomolar concentrations which causes a lot of analytical problems. So how do we balance it up? What tests do we use in what situations and when? Well, there are several scenarios we have to consider. First of all, the initial diagnosis. For initial diagnosis, the general recommendation of all professional bodies and of our laboratory is to measure TSH. It is equally useful where both hypo and hyperthyroidism has the highest sensitivity and specificity for initial diagnosis and is least likely to be disturbed by any non-thyroidal illness or drugs. The reason it is so exquisitely sensitive for changes in thyroid hormone function is that its response is magnified. When we look at this graph on the right, you can see that a doubling or halving of the free thyroxine concentrations will result in a hundredfold increase or decrement in the TSH concentration. So the response of TSH to changing thyroid hormone levels is greatly exaggerated, which facilitates the rapid feedback and is very useful for analytical measurements as it will show even minor changes in thyroid functions very graphically. The downside is that in some situations such an exaggeration might not give us a good measure of the overall severity because even a slightly severe thyrotoxicosis or hypothyroidism can give massive change in TSH. So free T4 measurements are often used when either the TSH alone is not clearly diagnostic, i.e. borderline measurements, or when there is some need to gauge the severity of hypo or hyperthyroidism. Finally, there's the odd situation where total T3 measurement can also be helpful. And this is really those cases where both TSH and FT4 measurements are on the fence or not clearly diagnostic. These recommendations are summarized in this algorithm which Mayo Medical Laboratories generally recommends for initial workup of non-hospitalized patients with suspected thyroid disease. We can clearly see it's primarily driven by the initial TSH measurement. If those is below the reference range, then hyperthyroidism can be suspected and can be further confirmed by the free thyroxine measurement. In rare cases where that is only borderline elevated, 
or not elevated in all, it could be that this is early Graves' disease, for example, where primarily total 3-iodothyronine would be elevated, and hence a total T3 measurement might be indicated. In situations of borderline lithyrotoxicosis, the algorithm is very similar. Finally, in the normal range, no further testing is generally justified. And uh, lastly, for those patients with elevated TSH, the diagnosis of hypothyroidism can be suspected. If the elevation is minor, this is typically called subclinical hypothyroidism, and a further supporting factor for that would be a normal T4. If the T4, the free T4 in particular, is also slightly depressed and the TSH is over 10, which we don't have in this algorithm, then generally a clinical diagnosis and biochemical diagnosis of manifest hypothyroidism is made. If etiology of that is in question, then autoantibodies to thyroid tissues can be measured. This can also be helpful in cases of subclinical or borderline hypothyroidism to determine what the risk of the patient is to progress to full-blown hypothyroidism. The next scenario is follow-up of patients. There are many more patients with established thyroid disease than with newly diagnosed thyroid disease, and many of them require lifelong or at least long-term follow-up. For those conditions uh, which are acute or subacute, like for example Graves' disease or subacute thyroiditis, it is important to measure FT4 because the changes in thyroid hormones can occur particularly under treatment intervention very rapidly and the TSH levels may lag a few days or even weeks behind. This can be observed particularly if the thyrotoxicosis has been long-standing. In those cases, there's actual atrophy in the pituitary gland of thyrotrope cells and it can take some weeks for TSH secretion to recover. In most cases, the FT4 measurement is therefore the best guide to therapy and resolution of Graves' disease or subacute thyroiditis, but it's usually also supplemented with TSH measurements. And we've already mentioned that in those rare cases where primarily T3 is secreted, a total T3 measurement can be useful. Chronic or slowly progressive conditions are a little different. Those primarily consist of permanent hypothyroidism or toxic nodular goiter, where there is either no progression in the disease or very slow progression. And here the TSH measurement is the mainstay, which is occasionally supplemented by FT4 measurements and rarely by total T3 measurements. Finally, there is some auxiliary testing, which is used to establish etiology or when things are murky. Anti-thyroid peroxidase autoantibodies or anti-thyroglobulin autoantibodies can be useful to assess the risk of progression of borderline hypothyroidism to complete hypothyroidism. If those autoantibodies are detectable, then there is a larger risk that a patient with borderline hypothyroidism will progress eventually to full-blown hypothyroidism. Anti-TSH receptor autoantibodies measured either by a binding assay or a bioassay can also be useful in some select situations. Those would include the differential diagnosis of Graves' disease versus a thyrotoxic phase of subacute thyroiditis, or for example also Graves' disease on top of a toxic goiter. Many patients with a toxic goiter may also develop Graves' disease. The main applications, however, are in pregnancy. First of all, a differential diagnosis between excessive vomiting of pregnancy versus first trimester Graves' disease. Sometimes Graves' disease can manifest for the first time in the first trimester. This is also the time when excessive vomiting and nausea can occur, and those by themselves through mechanisms which are not entirely clear but may involve very high levels of HCG cross-reacting on the TSH receptor can lead to apparent thyrotoxicosis. So here, detecting or not detecting anti-TSH receptor autoantibodies can give a definitive diagnosis. A second pregnancy-related scenario centers on the risk of a baby of a woman who had Graves' disease in the past to be afflicted by neonatal Graves' disease. Neonatal Graves' disease is caused by autoantibodies the mother still has in her system passing through the placenta to the baby, causing transient but sometimes severe thyrotoxicosis. As most of those mothers either would have had their Graves' disease treated or the Graves' disease would naturally go into a seeming remission in the second trimester, 
it is very difficult to use the mother's thyroid function testing to judge whether there is circulating autoantibodies which could affect the baby. Hence measurement of TSH receptor autoantibodies can be very helpful if those are significantly elevated either by a binding or activity assay then this means the baby is at risk of neonatal thyrotoxicosis and expert obstetric care is required. Thyroid hormone binding protein measurements are also useful in some situations, particularly if the inconsistent thyroid hormone test results are between the three tests we've mentioned before. They can occur in some situations where there are inherited or acquired abnormalities in binding proteins, sometimes related to drug treatment, sometimes related to congenital genetic conditions. The hallmark is that there's large discrepancies between free and total hormone levels, and those type of results should really tip one off that one might want to do a thyroid hormone binding protein measurements, either TBG concentration measurements or TBG binding capacity measurements. Finally, there are very, very rare cases where molecular analysis of the thyroid hormone receptor is useful. Those would be scenarios where 3 T4, total D4 and total D3 are elevated and TSH level is normal without there being an acute illness or interfering drug treatment which could cause this. Those patients may have inherited disorders of the thyroid hormone receptor, so-called thyroid hormone resistance, or some of these patients may have a TSH secreting pituitary tumor. So to close the section off, we should mention some thyroid hormone tests which are either uh, these days unnecessary or probably belong in the realm of voodoo. First of all, there is a free thyroxine index. This test is certainly no voodoo, but it is an indirect measure of free thyroxine and requires two analytical measurements, a total T4 measurement and a so-called resin T3 uptake test. What those tests do is they assess the total thyroid hormone level plus with the resin uptake test an indirect measurement of a thyroxine binding globulin concentrations. The two results are then multiplied and an index is formed. This has really no advantages over FT4 measurement while at the same time introducing additional testing, additional cost and of course additional analytical errors as the two analytical errors of the two methods are multiplicative. Another one in this category is reverse T3 which more tends towards the voodoo side of things. It was once in vogue for distinguishing non-thyroidal illness from thyroidal illness but was clinically really not found to be very useful. Mostly the clinical context and measurement of TSH, free T4, free T4 by dialysis and total T4 and total T3 will give a sufficient answer or comprehensive answer and reverse T3 does not add much. It does, however, have occasional niche application for suspected inherited or acquired abnormalities in deiodinase activity. These are the enzymes which in peripheral tissues convert T4, the pro-hormone, either to the active hormone T3 or the inactive hormone reverse T3. Such applications are really rare and generally most endocrinologists and let alone uh, general internists and general practitioners will never see patients in their lifetime who will need a reverse T3 test. 